to Rod Hanley and to Merle Carner and to Ron Fass. And, and did I say hello, Merle and Carl Damon and all the folks that I haven't had a chance to recognize yet. Mark Fournier. And of course, we're looking for Mr. Kemp. And we don't have Jeff yet. So Jeff's there. He's there. Jeff is here. He's, he's labeled as Stacy, though. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, great. And uh, she's let's way see. better looking than him. <laughs> Absolutely. And Jorge Ramos is here. So it's uh, 12 o'clock, and let's kick this off. This is time to get started with uh, with his deal. I'm George Tolls, and I want to say hello to all of you wonderful men who've gathered together today. This is going to be a special day. Uh, Jeff Kemp is always a, a celebration of 4th of July. I mean, he's got stuff happening all over his world and, and is just uh, gracious to be able to share it with us. And uh, uh, this is uh, also a sad time because we've got many people who are hurting and uh, it's just it's just tragic. We're going to have a time of prayer for them in just a, in just a few minutes. Uh, I want to say that we're finishing up the year really strong. Our friend uh, Denny Fitzpatrick is going to be with us on December 2nd. Can you believe we're talking about meetings in December? This is incredible. Where has this uh, miserable year gone? Actually, it's been a great year for many of us, too, in many ways. Isn't it fun to be able to spend more time with your spouse and your family and and uh, uh, still, still be in love after all of that? <laughs> Uh, and then on December 9th, our friend Doug Burley, who's our world traveler, we'll find out if he's been hopping back and forth to, uh, uh, to Russia or not. But Doug should be interesting to talk to from the standpoint of, of what's been going on in Washington, D.C. And as you know, we don't dabble in politics, but we sure do dabble in, in uh, spiritual fellowship and, and uh, unity. Um, so those are the guys that are coming up. I'm happy to tell you that in 2021, we're going to have a Bible study every month and a special speaker every month. So we'll have 12 and 12 instead of six and six. And uh, the, the overall theme for 2021 is how shall we now live and lead? So um, we, we hope that this will be um, instructive and inspiring for all of you. Now I'm going to ask my wonderful grandson here, Joe Hinckley, to take us through a, a quick tour of the uh, new website, because I know many of you haven't seen it yet, and it's so easy to get on our, our uh, 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 Zoom meeting. So, Joe, take it away. Hey everybody. I just wanted to give uh, people a quick reminder, uh, for those of you that were kind of wondering how to join the call today. Uh, all you need to do is go to hisdeal.org and then click our next meeting. And that'll take you right here where you can click join by video now if you're on your computer. Or if you want to call in, you can click join by phone now. Uh, and then the uh, link will also be available uh, on the emails that get sent out, the Hisdeal emails. If you miss uh, a meeting and you want to catch the recorded one, all you have to do is go to meetings right here in the, in the uh, nav bar. And the most recent meeting will show up right at the top. Click view this meeting. And then, and then the video recording uh, of that meeting will be right here. You can just hit play. Uh, we also have a new addition uh, in the resources page, recommended specialists. So if you want to view that, just hit view this resource. Grandpa, do you want to tell them a little bit about this? Well, I just wanted to share with you that we've got some some of the guys on, on the call right now. But this is a, an idea that we had to, to be able to put our men in touch with every conceivable major field in life. So if you have questions, you won't feel like you're alone. So if you're into relationships, um, John Trent, here's, here's Ed Rush dealing with entrepreneurships. John Trent with relationships. Uh, this is uh, Sean Dunn with uh, JesusCares.com, Groundwire Evangelism. Here's Todd Dutzman, our wonderful friend up in the Stanford, Stan, Stanwood, uh, dealing with hardships. Jeff Kemp building teams. And we're fortunate to have Jeff with us today. Look at those titles. CEO, soul coach, team trainer, fatherhood ambassador. The guy does it all. Personal money management with our friend Doug Peterson. And uh, questions with Rob Titi. And um, accountability, Rod Hanley. It's great to have Rod on the call today on the Zoom. And Brad Dacus of dealing with justice, Bob Beal on leadership, 
And here's Andre Benjamin. So if you want, if you have a question for Bob, you just go to Bob, hit the email button, click on there, and boom, there's your. Uh, um, what's that, Joe? They can't see your email, but okay, they can't see my email. But there's there's an email all uh, addressed to Bob for you, so it just puts you in touch with these people instantly. Okay, let me get out of here. And uh, here's uh, Jonathan Katherman with uh, parenting. So we've got a couple more to, to be added, um, but that's uh, quite a lineup, and we're happy to put those guys in touch with you. Now I wanted to. Uh, share some prayer requests here, Joe. Um, Kurt Lux, our friend, is in Virginia Mason Hospital. He's got circulation problems. He's had four toes already removed and uh, potentially to lose a foot. Um, I have one brother who's really battling depression. And um, Dave Hood, our friend, is uh, in very serious condition with COVID-19 in Swedish Hospital. His wife, Margaret, has it as well. Ray Brook, of course, battling cancer. Phil Butler with all kinds of difficult situations health-wise. George Duff, uh, Corky Frady, so many. Um, and I've asked our friend Ray Fry if he would go to the throne of grace for us, with us this morning and lead us in prayer, not only for these brothers, but for our nation and our world and for Jeff and our time together. Ray. Thank you, George. Father God, we come before you this morning, all of us here on the Zoom call, humbled by your greatness, your mercy, your boundless love. We ask, especially this morning, that you would bless us, each and every one of us, we know heaven rejoices. We know that your greatest joy is to bless all of your children that you love. We ask that you would bless our children, our wives, our families. These are hard times now, Father. There is lots of unknown. There are issues. There's, uh, uh, we, we have things going on that confuse and one thing we know is that to you, there is no confusion. To you, there's none of this anxiety. Mm -hmm. We know that you love us, boundless love. And Father God, we pray to you now, especially. We pray in the language 4,000 years ago. Blessed be the Lord, our God, King of the universe, who bestows upon us, gives us, and meets all of our needs. We thank you, Father God. Mm. We are here today because we love you, we trust you. In Jesus Christ, our Lord's name, amen. Thank you, Ray. Powerful prayer. Good to see Rajesh. Is that how you say your name, Rajesh? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for coming. This is your first time, I believe. Yes. Great. Jeff McDermott, good to see you, brother. And uh, Jed. Jonathan, running your children all over, probably to preschool. PJ Glassy, Stephen Drew. Let's see who else we haven't recognized yet. Uh, Alan Pratt. Hello, Alan. And uh, anybody else I haven't named? Big, big shout yeah. out to Merle Carner if we haven't already. Um, I will in my prayers every day uh, for our defunded police department here in downtown Seattle. Thank you. Appreciate it. Oh, oh thank you. Thank you for all you do. <laughs> and let's see, we have um, Joel Graves. Joel Graves. Is it Graves, Joel? 
That's right. Yes, I'm a, a friend of Jed. He sent me the invite. So very glad to be here today. Wonderful. Thank you. Hey, Joel, how you doing? Excellent. Thank you. Curtis Holmes is here. George. Darren, Darren would you pronounce your name for me, sir? Wait a minute here. Darren C. Darren C. Jeff Kemps. Hey, Darren. Hey, Darren. I think I've lost control. <laughs> and uh, Warren Mock has checked in. And Jorge Ramos, Ed McCahill. So let's George Schemaninski is here today. I think everyone needs to make sure they're muted. And also, phones are turned off. Yeah, George. Yes. Gimadinsky is with us for the first time. I'd like to introduce him. Please uh, do. His, his picture was here a minute ago. Uh, now it isn't, <laughs> but I think he's still with us. I, I sure am. Thanks. Good to have you. Good to have you. Uh, me able to be able to join you guys. Ski and I, uh, we we didn't realize that we met a couple of weeks ago in a men's prayer group that we have every Saturday morning, and we realized that we've been working side by side in different ministries for about 40 years or so, and that we both knew and could count Connie Jacobson as one of our very good friends. So uh, uh, right away we hit it off and I thought it'd be great if he could join us today. Well, thank you, thank you. And when I look at this uh, Hollywood Squares wall here of <laughs> characters, it uh, just reminds me of how important relationships are. There's a, we could take a tree and, and follow the, the root system and see what all the connections are. It would, it would be wonderful. Our lives are shaped by relationships. In Jeff Kemp's case, he's always been in a close family. 11 years of pro football, a lot of relationships there. See Norm Evans here. Leadership positions in Christian and political organizations. It makes sense then that his post-NFL career has targeted focusing on your true identity strengthening marriages, elevating fatherhood, and creating great teams. Uh, Jeff is a busy speaker at the men's groups, a one-on-one -on -one soul coach to CEOs and the top leaders, and he's the son of a former member of the president's cabinet, who was also on the national ticket as a candidate for vice president, that being his father, the late Jack Kim. Jeff sees problems as opportunities the way any good quarterback would. Um, and he still faces blitz in his life and, and helps us face ours. He sees the potential in the problem at hand. As the patriarch Joseph discovered, God can flip what was meant for evil into good. And his, uh, his dream wife, Stacy, he and uh, Stacy live in Little Rock, have four married sons and daughters-in-law and five perfect grandchildren, I'm told. Just absolutely perfect. So let's welcome Jeff Kemp, huh? Jeffrey, it's good to be with you, my friend. I what understand. I understand you're going to build some teams here today. We're going to start off with a little uh, team building exercise. Um, but first, I'll kind of give you a prayer. So God is in charge of this time. Yep. Um, George, you can break in at any point um, because you're George Tolls. And they said this is God's deal, but I kind of think it's your deal. Um, and uh I respect the Holy Spirit and I respect you. You guys need to know that George mentored me uh, when he was leading the board of directors for Norm Evans. So I had Norm and George as mentors. Norm would throw me up to speak uh, at the conferences um, and George would sit with me and guide with me and tell me how a nonprofit is run, how to seek the Lord, um, how to be humble and lead others. I've always appreciated both those men, Norm and George, for their incredible influence in my life. Uh, let's open up in prayer, guys, uh, in addition to what Ray prayed. Father God, I just pray that what I say would be what you want me to say, that it would come from the Father, that it would agree with the Word, that it would point to Jesus. And I pray that every single guy Remember that he is here for a reason. He is here on purpose. There is no accident. You have created him, designed him, mapped out his days. You're calling him closer to you today. And I pray he'd hear what you want him to hear. 
directly to his heart. And then he would uh, take some action with it, that he would uh, be ready to be transformed and be your ambassador. So I guide this time, Lord, we thank you for his deal. We particularly pray for Dave Hood and this serious um, situation with COVID and hospitalization um, and for his wife who is ill at the same time. Lord, do a miracle to bring glory to you and advance and extend his ministry and, and your story through Dave. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I think Mark Fournier is on here. Mark Fournier is on here and Rod Hanley and Steve Woodworth and Jim Hebert. Uh, I used to work for Garrick Pang. It's good to see my old boss, Garrick Pang, uh, on here. Uh, Alan Pratt and Ed McCahill, who is uh, definitely one of my mentors and guides today. Uh, he's our Ron Blue um, stewardship financial advisor and a fabulous friend to me. And uh, Dartmouth College champion of protecting brain health, uh, Darren Sedebach is on. So amongst all you other wonderful guys, uh, good to see a bunch of those old friends. Uh, I want to take you to 1986, Rockland, California, training camp for the San Francisco 49ers. I've just been traded to the team. Uh, John Robinson, the coach of the Rams, uh, called me up on the phone during the offseason, probably in April or so. And uh, he knew I'd been frustrated sitting the bench the year before after starting in 1984. And uh, he said, hey, Jeff, um, listen, I know you were kind of uh, stuck, you know, on the bench a little bit more than you wanted, uh, but we're going to make a trade and uh, we're going to send you to a place. Got a really good opportunity for you. I said, really, where are you sending me, coach? He said, we're trading you to San Francisco uh, to the 49ers. So uh, good luck. You'll do great there. I said, OK, thanks, John. He was quite a salesman and uh, hung up. And then I looked at Stacey. I said, I just got traded. And Robinson said, it's a re really good opportunity. Oh no, it's the 49ers. Joe Montana's there. I'm never going to play. <laughs> anyway, Robinson kind of sold me the bill of goods. I get up there to San Francisco and uh, that actually turned out to be my favorite year because Montana uh, got hurt for a while and I got to play and got coached by Holmgren um, and Walsh. But in training camp, most teams split the offensive players up by position. They, the tight ends go in one room, the quarterbacks in another, running backs in another, wide receivers in another, line in another. And they train us in the new plays that they're putting in for that day at practice separately. Then we go out on the practice field and we all do our part and it fits together and you run the play. And it's kind of awkward at first, but eventually uh, you get it and, and you improve it through practice. Bill Walsh didn't do this on all the plays, but occasionally he would do this. I don't know any other coaches in the NFL that did it this way. Occasionally he would come in, grab the whole offense's attention, keep all of us in the same meeting room, get up to the whiteboard. And he'd say, okay, today we're going to put in Brown, right? Fox two Z post play action pass. We're trying to hit Jerry Rice on a post over the free, over the free safety after convincing the defense that this is a run play. Uh, but before we put in Brown, right? Fox two Z post, I got to tell you why we're doing it guys. Uh, we're going to put it in together because I want you all to understand what one another do. And I want you to go on the practice field today and execute it at a very high level. And I want tomorrow to see it executed at a higher level and three weeks from now at a much higher level and six weeks when we're in the season and 12 weeks when we're in the playoffs, I want to see this play executed at a better and better, higher and higher level. So Brown Wright Fox 2Z post is important. But one of the reasons it's important is because this play is going to help us get to the Super Bowl. And our goal this year is to win a Super Bowl. In fact, we want to win more Super Bowls this decade than anyone else. Okay, let's put in Brown Wright, Fox 2, Z Post. At that point, there isn't one guy who's nodding off, not one guy who's on his cell phone. Of course, we didn't have cell phones back in 1986. Uh, no one's doodling on his pad. We're all on the edge of our seat. We're leaning in. We want to hear what our visionary leader is going to give us, not just the vision of the Super Bowl and more of them than anyone else this decade. We want to hear how to put in Brown Wright Fox 2Z posts. What, what do I do? What are the line? What's the line do? What's Jerry Rice do? And then he proceeds to explain this play action pass will mimic a run through the two hole. We want all the linemen to dive a cut block toward the left, convince the defense it's a, it's a run. 
Roger Craig, running back, come behind the quarterback, head towards the two hole, quarterback, turn around, stick the ball. I think I got a ball here, George, a little show and tell. Right. <laughs> stick the ball in his stomach, pull the ball out at the last second and do an Olay move and follow him with your hand into the, into the hole. Roger, you wrap up an imaginary football because it's actually not in your arms. And your job is to run full speed into that hole. If there's no hole and you have to dive over the line of scrimmage to convince them it's a run play, dive over the line of scrimmage. Don't protect your head. You're going to get hit in the head. You're not going to get any yards on the stat sheet for this play because you don't have the ball. But if you convince them for two steps that this is a run play, then Jerry Rice, after going down and stutter stepping like he's going to block, which he's been doing tough all game long, can get open and run behind the free safety quarterback. After you pull that ball out and do the Olay fake, set up at five uh, steps, take one bounce in the pocket, get rid of the ball either to Jerry if he's open on the post or drop it off to your second or third receiver very quickly because we don't block the left or the right defensive end on this play because it's supposed to look like a run play. So he won't know to hit you until after about three seconds. So make sure you get it off in about 2.4 seconds. You might get hit. He, he may land on top of you, but if we've got the free safety to take two steps up and you get the ball into Jerry's arms and he catches it and takes it to the end zone, it's all worth it. And you know what? That play was worth it. We scored, I think, when, during my six weeks of playing, uh, Jerry had eight touchdowns and five of them were on Brown, Wright, Fox, do, two Z post from di different derivations and formations. And we did improve that play all year long to where it did help us go to the playoffs. And we didn't win the Super Bowl that year, but the 49ers did win the Super Bowl more than any other team in the decade. And the keys to this type of leadership and this type of teamwork is that number one, the leader, has to bring the team occasionally together. And you got to battle for this in the COVID separation, you know, Zoom era. And then the, the leader has to cast a vision that's compelling and powerful and dynamic and future oriented, something big like win a Super Bowl. And then tie that giant vision to the specific role and sacrifice of every individual player in such a way that Jerry Rice actually respects the offensive linemen and how difficult their job is. And the quarterback respects the tight end and the running back and what's difficult about his job. And pretty soon each of you learn about others, value their strength, their differences, how they complement one another, the sacrifices they need to make. And guess what? When you because you trust that they're doing something mm -hmm. sacrificial as well. All of you know, Pat Lencioni says the key to great teamwork is trust. You can't have great trust without relationships. You can't have great relationships without knowing each other. You can't have great relationships without knowing each other in a vulnerable and honest way. Those are some of the components of building that team culture, but the teamwork has to also cast the vision where we're going, what each team player does, how important it is, how meticulous they're responsibility and, and activity is and the sacrifice that it takes. And then you can trust one another enough to give your sacrifice. Mm. All right. So identity matters. We are the 49ers and we're going to win more Super Bowls than anyone else. Destiny matters. Vision for where we're going, the roles, the respect for one another, and then the trust that they'll do their part. So I'll do my part. And of course, sacrifice. I don't know if you know, any of you guys were applying this to a non-business area, but what about marriage? Do you have the vision for your marriage that your marriage is representing the mystery of the most beautiful relationship in all of humankind, God's relationship with us, mm -hmm. Jesus's relationship with us, the, his, the church, his bride, and he lays down his life for us. And there's going to be a great wedding banquet when we get to heaven. And we're going to be living in the light of his glory. We won't, we won't need, you know, spotlights and fluorescent lights and sunshine. We're going to have Jesus lighten it all up. The vision for marriage is tied to the vision of eternity and the vision of God's love for us. 
your marriage has a lot more importance, man, than you realize. Not just because happy wife, happy life. No, a good marriage will conform you to the image of Christ because it's hard as heck and your selfishness gets exposed. And it will conform her to the image of Christ because vice versa. And Patrick Chan, Francis Chan, excuse me, Francis Chan says that the best marriages probably don't just sit around navel gazing, trying to reach nirvana and happiness with one another. That's a little bit self-centered. You should learn a ton about each other and how to please each other. But what if you get on mission together to love your kids like crazy and train and disciple them to know Jesus? What, what, what? mission like Norman Bobby Evans to reach out to pro athletes who won't listen to anyone else other than a married couple who knows what it's like to be in pro football and has made it. Mm -hmm. And then you build a ministry that's reached thousands of baseball, football, basketball players, coaches, because a marriage was on mission. They didn't have a perfect marriage, but it got better because of working together. Plus they had a ton of difference in my life. Stacey and I wouldn't be married if it wasn't for Norman Bobby and George and Liz and Chuck and Barb Snyder and Gary Smalley and his humor, which finally got through this thick head of mine. So I'd start paying attention to these marriage messages. My wife, she used to leave these marriage books on my uh, dresser, uh, my nightstand, and she'd have like dog-eared pages and sticky notes and yellow uh, highlights of stuff I should read to become a good husband. And I never read the stuff she gave me because uh, I'm a typical husband. But then I heard Gary Smalley at a pro athletes outreach conference and he was funny as heck. He just cracked jokes for about 20 minutes. And then he took us to God's blueprints in the Bible. And uh, I said, this guy's awesome. I love him. She said, that's the same guy I gave you all those books from. I said, oh, I thought he was some whooped wimp. Uh, but now I know he's a real man's man. I like him. So I started paying attention. Well, let's do an exercise on what type of leader, what type of teammate are you? Where do you fit in the team? Okay, and the, the first exercise I want you to do is drawing kind of a picture of where you fit in the work styles grid based on your strengths. So get out a piece of paper, you guys, and a pen, and recreate this, this uh, box with four quadrants. This is the work styles grid. Patrick Lencioni uh, taught this to me and says it's a real simple way to get a team talking about who plays wide receiver, who plays line, who plays running back, how do they do it, why do they do it, what their strength is, and where you fit in the team. So you can see at the top is task and at the bottom is people. And over here on this side is asking people things. And over here is telling people things, a little more directorial, right? So once you see those working styles, are you more of a task person or a people person? Do you just wanna put your head down and do a task, you know, keep the interruptions and people out of my way? Or are you more of a people person, social, extrovert, relationship, storytelling? And then the other question is, are you more of an ask questions, figure it all out, analyze it like an engineer? Or are you more of a, hey, let's inspire everyone. Let me tell them where we're going. You're that excitable, energetic leader galvanizing everyone. Once you kind of figure out where you are in those, put yourself in one of those quadrants. I'll tell you where I am. I'm in this quadrant right here. This one down here. All right, everyone filled it out and put themselves somewhere. Now let's flip it over and take a look at who you are. Hey, Types Jeff, of leaders. Given for interrupting. Guys, if you're looking and, and you have a grid view where Jeff's really small. In the upper right hand corner of your Zoom, you can click on view. And if you click speaker view, um, Jeff will come to you much bigger. Yeah, please maximize me. 
It fits with my it fits with my character of humor of humility. All right, so there are amiables that are in this corner here, very into people and asking questions. There are expressives in this quadrant. That's where I am. Very into people and very into talking. And in fact, they love to instruct and tell, to inspire. And then there are engineers, analyticals up in this box. They're gonna ask a lot of questions and they love tasks. And over here, we've got General Patton. We got the driver, we got Vince Lombardi. He's gonna tell you what to do and he's gonna get the task done. And guess what? God made every one of these styles, just like everything else. The trick is submitting these things to him and realizing we usually have a, a flip side to our coin, a weakness that goes with our strength. And we don't always humble ourselves and honor others in their strength. And if, it's this, if this happens in marriage, we pretty much want the other person to change, to be like us, which is really stupid. I wouldn't want my wife to look like me. I, I wouldn't want her body to be like mine. Uh, and I really shouldn't want her personality to be like mine because we would never get anywhere on time. We would have lost the kids at school. We'd never uh, make our connecting flights. Our bills would never be paid. We would have had uh, you know, the bill collectors at the door. I'd have fudged way too many gray areas, probably been in jail a couple of times. I need my wife. And yet she needs me to have a party every now and then because she'd just be vacuuming and doing the, the budget the whole time. All right, here's the next exercise, guys. Now, you know that projects go from start to finish. And there are people that are entrepreneurs who get the ball rolling. But entrepreneurs aren't always the best to build that company from good to great, are they? To use Jim Collins' language. The entrepreneur sometimes hasn't figured out how to develop people, how to mentor, how to structure, how to let go, how to do the Max Dupree thing, which is leadership is the art of abandoning yourself to the strengths of others, to quote a George Toll's friend. Leadership is the art of abandoning yourself to the strengths of others. That's a level five leader, a humble leader, a Jesus leader that develops others, develops his 12. And then Jesus not only steps back, Jesus headed out for good and said, it's better that I go away and send the Holy Spirit to you guys to be everywhere in the world at the same time, then I stay here and be limited to one spot. Okay, so there's starters and finishers. There's growers and there's maintainers. Here are some of the um, different de descriptions of where your strengths lie in, in these areas. And this is from a brand new survey and assessment tool from Pat Lencioni and the table group uh, called the Six Working Geniuses. And I'm looking at many geniuses out there. Um, Darren Siedebacke, despite his concussion, still qualifies as a genius. He's doubting me because he knows I've had seven. Um, his nonprofit, if you're concerned about brain injuries, um, one hit away in San Francisco is working to publicize that there's hope for healing brains. We need to take care of them and we need to heal them and we need to get that help right away. He has a certain genius and he probably doesn't have other geniuses. You're gonna find that you probably have two of these as dominant uh, geniuses that energize you. Two of them you're pretty good at, but they don't necessarily energize you. They're, they're not your best strength. And two of these six, to use the vernacular, you suck at these. And I know, cause I suck at a few things. Garrick worked for me. He knew I did not have the, the administrative and execution bone in me. We, I kind of missed that. I needed others to do that. Okay, so two of these energize, two of these you can survive, two of them de-energize. All right, let's take a look. These are the six working geniuses. This is the start of a project on this end. This is the finish and the completion and the maintenance of a project. And some of us are this very first phase. Our genius is wonder. We wonder, couldn't this be done better? Couldn't we fix this? Isn't there a better way? God made some of us that way. And we get the ball rolling and think of new things no one could have thought of. 
and that things should be improved that no one even realized should be improved. And then the next stage is invention. Some of you are ideators. You come up with ideas all day long. You're probably in the invention genius. And then a little bit further down the process and the timeline, the sequence of a project is discernment. That's Pat Lencioni's great, great strength. He can discern and synthesize and explain anything. Discernment decides if the invention is any good, if the wonder is making any sense. How do we, how do we put a strategy together to execute it? And then there's the galvanizer. That's the leader. The galvanizer is the one who can articulate the vision like Bill Walsh did. Bill Walsh must have had the invention and the galvanizing because he was a really good motivator. John Gruden is a galvanizer. You galvanize the team, you bring them together, you motivate them, you engage them, you get them moving. If you got to kick them in the butt, you kick them in the butt. If you love them, you got to love them. You inspire them to be more than they were going to be. George, this is the Gideon principle. You speak into your people the character and achievement that they haven't even achieved yet. Like the angel said, hey, Gideon, I know you're hiding, but uh, you're a great and mighty warrior. You're a mighty man of valor. Well, he was no such thing yet. But the angel of the Lord, Jesus, is a galvanizer, and he was getting him going. Jeff. And then this next stage, as we get further along in the sequence and timeline, is enable. Enablement's a bad psychology word, but enabling is a good word when you are the person that says, I'll help you with that. I'll do whatever you want. I'll do it on your terms. I'll stay extra. I'll work late. I'll throw extra routes to you. I'll catch extra passes to you. I'll watch more film. I'll clean the floor. I'll, I'll do the dishes. Rich Beggar, great leader. He, he headed a couple wireless companies. He used to take out the trash and unload the dishwasher at his company and his employees would always say, Rich, why are you doing that? You know, you're the CEO. He said, oh, it just needed to be done. Rich's role model set the stage for others helping one another. Okay, and then the final one, someone needs to finish this task. Someone needs, needs to bring this whole thing home. And that's not me. I'm not around to finish it. I'm on to something new. And this is called tenacity. Tenacity to finish, carry out the details. So just mark yourself, where, which, which are your top two? And if you really want to be accurate, you can go to the table group and take their uh, inventory. I think it's $25, uh, but it's a fascinating thing. What if your kids, what are the people in your company? Uh, what if you and your wife uh, went through this? It gives you some great conversation. Okay, any quick questions from anyone before we uh, jump into the next section? You're doing great. Okay, well, thank you, God. We prayed that he'd help me. We knew I needed it, George. <laughs> You're on a roll, Jeff. All right, so uh, I don't know if this, this week is officially um, the This Is Your Life segment, but I'm going to take you a little bit into my life, and I'm going to make sure that we talk about your life and what you've been going through. Uh, then I'm going to tell you a story about a reconciling leader, Reggie White. Uh, George has a couple thoughts for us that'll tie into my message um, about teamwork and leadership God's way, and really pursuing what he's got for us. Um, and then I want to hear your ahas. Aha. Oh, wow. I heard that. Your takeaways. What's God saying to you during this message? Please write it down. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Your father wants to speak to you. I'm not really important. I'm not really here speaking. The one that you're listening to is the father. The same way Jesus always listen to the father. Okay, so we're gonna do some ahas, some takeaways. Um, you can throw a few questions in here along the way. You can use chat with George if you want, and he'll get the question to me. And then when we close, you may think of something you need to confess. 
something you'd like to change in your life. And you might even want to say it in front of other men because it's way more powerful than this little private prayer to God that you say over and over, but you never really change because you never got clear and lived in the light and confessed it to others. Um, I'm going to share with you an opportunity to do that and a lesson I'm learning about continuous revival, continually being revived by the Holy Spirit because we're getting humble and confused. Uh, what's going on in my life? COVID has been interesting. March 7th, I got a call that my speech in California to 600 guys was canceled. And the next couple of days, every other retreat, every other men's conference, every other speech was canceled. And Stacy was happy because I stopped traveling too much. And uh, the good news was she said I could start writing more on my book that I've been taking 16 years to write uh, for men. Um, actually, I've been working on it for about a year but I really need to buckle down. And I used some of that COVID time to do that. And I connected with my wife again after being probably gone too much in the fall and early winter. Um, and most importantly, I really went on a journey of trying to get to know God as my father. And it was awesome. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. As for your COVID year, I lost those speeches. I lost all the income. Um, obviously, God um, is taking care of us, but I didn't play football any time in the last 30 years. So there's, it, it was all spent on college education. Uh, so th there's no big uh, bankroll here, but God is my bankroll and he's got us covered. We're not too worried. Um, but social distancing the economic shutdowns, the economic damage, the amount of businesses that went out of business and jobs, what it's done to your job, your finances, your situation, uh, the pain of race relations, awareness of racism that still exists, conversations that have been difficult and then made worse by the media and exaggerated social media, um, anti-police unrest, kind of the demonization in politics and polarization, this crazy election. Spiritual warfare. Satan wants to divide people from God and from one another. He's doing it in families over politics. Doing it in couples, neighbors, mm -hmm. churches, you know? And, and Miles McPherson explains it really well. It all goes back to Satan's trick. It's an us versus them mentality instead of a we mentality. God made us in his image. We're all masterpieces. We need one another. We're part of the body. Even if someone doesn't know God yet, he may get to know God and there's a valuable soul there made in his image. We got to treat him like that as a potential pre-Christian, including the politician who you dislike the most. And you're accountable to how you speak about that person. And do you pray for them? So anyway, COVID's not been an easy year for you. A couple of quick examples of the type of stuff that's happened. I'm coaching a guy right now, fabulous, amazing leader, uh, top of his field in the country, literally. The very, very best in his field. It happens to be a sport. And he got fired during COVID in a shocking way because of a confluence of circumstances, including budget. And he's gonna lose a couple million dollars over a couple years. And he's already in not good financial shape. Pretty much of a COVID blitz. My son. George loquacious means you talk a whole lot. I want to help you with that. Okay. Corey worked at the Seahawks for nine years, dream job. He's got a Super Bowl ring on his hand, which I don't after 11 years playing. Um, it's not fair. He was in his dream job and they let him go due to COVID downsizing and he was excellent at his job. They told him that, it had nothing to do with him. And I lost all my speeches and all my income and was grounded. Mm -hmm. So during this guy's blitz that lost the really big, cool job, 
um, and all that income. He went into a spiral and depression and isolation. And eventually, guess where it led him? To surrender his life to Jesus Christ for the first and only time ever in his life. He now is going to heaven. Mm -hmm. He has the Holy Spirit in him. He understands, and this helped him understand it, that God is three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He could never figure out, how can this Jesus guy be real? Everyone talks about receiving Jesus, receiving Jesus, believe in Jesus. He doesn't even, he's not around. I don't see him. And we talked about how Jesus is with the Father now after having come to earth for a period of time before he died, and then he sent the Holy Spirit. That's who moves in our hearts. And this, this man now has the Holy Spirit in his life. He has Jesus as his Savior. He has the Father as his perfect Father to make up for his very hard and mean Father. And so God has brought greatness out of loss and blitz. My son, Corey, he grew his faith like crazy. He trusted God, went to the Word, asked us for prayer. I really was impressed by his character, saw him growing. And two and a half months later, he's found a, a sales job in, in uh, technology, B2B sales in Seattle. And he's learning a whole new field and he's going to be better for it and make more money. God does good things when we trust him and turn to him with a team. Mm -hmm. Not right away, not easily. And then as for me, um, my big excitement with the, this, this COVID blitz for me is the journey that I went on to pursue my relationship with the father as his, my father. You know, Jesus called him Abba Father. I didn't really know what that was like. So I, I, I read a great book called Father God, um, Dare to Draw Near by Dave Patty. Uh, my, my friend, Ed Tandy McGlasson that played football with me uh, in California has written books about fatherhood and, and how we can live by the receive principle that Jesus lived by, where Jesus didn't do or say anything that he didn't receive from the Father. And we're invited to the same father-son relationship that Jesus had. Yeah, there's the book, George, show it. How can I, how can I do this? Just hold it the camera. Yeah, that's good, just put it in front of the camera. Nice. So I used that book and I used some of Ed McGlasson's books on fathering and I used Ed's idea of pursue the receive principle and read the Bible as a son of God. Pray to God as a son, not as a Christian, not as a speaker. Come to him as father. And I've started sitting with God for three or four minutes every morning before I do anything else. And just saying, God, I'm your son. Thank you so much. Uh, father me today. Speak to me, guide me. I want to receive from you. I'm listening. I'll tell you what, Bible reading becomes a lot more exciting when you're waiting to see what the God, the Father is going to reveal to you. So that has been exciting as heck, learning the receive principle of Jesus. And it doesn't happen automatic. There's no formula. It's just coming to God in an intimate way. Um, I was playing tennis with Stacy about two months ago, and it was 7 a.m. I hadn't spent any time with God yet that morning. I just got out of bed at the last second, went to play tennis, and... Uh, I'm supposed to be a nice husband to her and not get too competitive or mad. Um, and uh, I was mad at myself for some bad shots. And I immediately stopped myself at 7.10 in the morning. And I thought, I am not playing tennis like a son of the father. Mm. I've got to switch. I want to play tennis like a son. And I immediately, I said, God, I want to play as a son. And during the whole rest of that two sets of tennis, I was rejoicing that I'm his son, that he loves me unconditionally. He says, you're my beloved son. I'm well pleased with you because Jesus gave you his righteousness to your account by grace because you put your faith in me. And I see the version of you, Jeff, who you're going to be in heaven right now before you're even halfway decent. So I'm really smiling at you, Jeff, and I like you. I don't just love you, I like you. And I started receiving that identity as the father's son right there on the tennis court. It changed the way I played. Stacy enjoyed the tennis a lot. I still made sure that I beat her, um, but I was very gracious about it. And then the rest of my day, I wanted to live as a son. I wanna do this, his deal, as a son. I don't wanna do it as Jeff as a speaker. 
I'm his son. Everything you do, guys, with your wife, with your kids, with your grandkids, with a friend, going out to dinner, having a glass of wine, paying your bills, investing your money, going to the hospital for cancer treatments. All of it you do as a son, which is way better than doing it alone. And certainly is better than doing it to try to earn your identity by proving that you're a good quarterback or a good business person or a perfect Christian, which there are none of except Jesus. Performance is not the way to get our identity. You cannot earn it. It must be received. Mm. In fact, the cool thing about the receive principle is that once you receive your identity as a beloved son, you don't stop receiving. And you don't stop being a son. I'm not really Jack Kemp's son in the sense that I call up daddy and say, hey, dad, what should I do today? Dad, 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 can I borrow the keys? No, I kind of graduated from that phase. But no, I'm not graduating ever from being his son. I want to be more and more of a son every day, more mm -hmm. dependent, more listening, more pliable, more humble. So that's what God's been doing to me. And I'll tell you what, here's my journal. And it's more full this year than ever before. I'm writing squares. I'll show you. I'm writing squares like these right here. That's an open-ended box saying, God, I'm asking you a question. I'd love to hear you answer it for me. Ooh, ooh. I do the same thing with prayer requests. I write an open-ended box. And sometimes I even go back and date when he answers it, but it tells me that I'm waiting to receive from him. Reading the Bibles, like I said, it's, it's a blast. And praying is no longer some checklist in my book. I don't feel guilty if I don't pray about everything. I say, God, what should I pray about today? And he brings someone to mind, I pray about it. There's freedom in the Father. So I think God's using COVID in the best cases to bring dads back home, Christians to question their presumptions, let go of the illusion of control, stop living for the, the, the temporal kingdom, the kingdom of Jeff, the kingdom of now. No, let's, let's, let's live the real life, the, the abundant life, the, the kingdom life, mm. the kingdom of God life. Those are some of the things I think God's doing. Uh, questioning some of our presumptions and assumptions and our attachments to this world and saying, you know what, relationships vertically and horizontally are what matters. And we do need to heal some rela relationships, which has taken me to my story about Reggie White, the Minister of Defense, 1992 training camp, Philadelphia. I'm at the end of my career, and he knows that I'm a mature uh, Christian player. And he says, hey, Jeff, we're going to do a Bible study tonight. Um, and I want you to teach on uh, Nehemiah, read, read to us from Nehemiah, and I'm going to talk to us about Ezra. Um, and so Reggie brings me into this opportunity. It was just like Norm Evans. He said, okay, I'm going to let you lead. But obviously, I kind of let uh, Reggie do most of the leading because he was phenomenally spirit-led and very biblically trained. And he had the respect of all the guys having been there for many years. Um, greatest defensive end ever, strongest man you'd ever see, um, and gentle. He spent his Tuesdays on the streets of Philadelphia feeding the poor and talking to uh, street kids. The rest of us were in the training room getting our body fixed uh, or, or taking some time off with our family. He, he was ministering. Anyway, so Reggie said, let's do this Bible study. We had about 25 guys. It's training camp, so a lot of guys show up. Norm remembers that. Training camp, everyone comes because they want to make the team uh, after they make the team, they don't always show up to the God things and chapels. But um, Reggie had me share about what Nehemiah did, his humility, his confession, uh, his apologies, his responsibility for the whole uh, people of Israel and, and the walls being broken down. And then he explained some things from Ezra and other passages. And, and then he said, this whole message is about reconciling men, about being one about unity under God. We are his creations. We are far more alike than different. And he said, there's a lot of division, a lot of, a lot of prejudice, a lot of discrimination, a lot of attitudes, racism, and it goes both ways many times. 
He said, so I'm going to go first mm -hmm. and I'm going to apologize to every one of you white guys for my attitudes, any bitterness I've had, any negativity toward whites. And I'm going to also forgive you guys and let you know I'm not judging you holding slavery or white supremacy or instances of, of my being pulled over by the police when I didn't deserve to get pulled over or the many, many slights I've faced in my life or that I know other blacks face. I'm not going to hold those against you. I forgive you. God forgave me. I can't hold any grudges. I'm going to go first. And he went around and apologized to every single one of us. Every one of us went around the room, looked at every single guy in the eye and did our own apology and our own sense of forgiveness. And then a rookie that year, number one draft pick from University of Alabama, Saran Stacy, started to cry. And we asked him, Saran, man, what, what's going on? What's, what's wrong? And he said, you know what? I've never, he grew up in Alabama, deep, deep South. He said, I've never had a white person apologize to me in my life. And spontaneously, every single guy in that group finished that Bible study and hugged every other guy of white and black. And we had a couple of uh, Samoan guys. We hugged each other and we were together like never before. It was the greatest picture of reconciliation. And it took a humble leader who chose to go first by taking the log out of his eye when frankly his log was really teeny compared to a lot of our other bigger logs. Wouldn't it be sweet to see a president or a leader of the Senate or House, or a pastor, or a CEO, or a stinking Division I football coach who was so wrapped up in his winning that it's like he's just driving the kids into the ground. Wouldn't it be great to see him go first and apologize? That confession, both to God and personally to others. You know, the Bible says there's great blessing when brothers hang out together and dwell in unity. We don't see as much blessing as we should because the church doesn't like one another's denominations. And we don't like the way some people preach or sing. And we don't like other people's political views. And we're letting politics be too important, thinking that, oh, there's biblical principles at stake. This nation is at risk. Good. Pray hard, research hard, debate and persuade hard, but do not put your faith in any nation or in politics, or you will be no effect at all in the ambassadorship for Jesus Christ that really needs to win the ultimate battle of bringing people to know Christ and reconcile them, them to him. A lot of us are known a lot more for our positions and, and our intensity than we are for our love and our relationships and our humility. The team leader, Mr. Husband, Mr. Dad of grown sons who the years, do not wait for your son to get his act together and apologize to you or, or live well. Find anything you can apologize for because you have plenty. Learn the lessons of your past. Go share a few of the things you're learning with your son or daughter and then apologize. Say, if there's anything else, let me know. I want to apologize for that too. That's the very best parenting of adult children I've done in the last uh, several years is my apologies to my grown kids. So to be your best teammate, you got to know your identity. You got to know the team's mission, which is God's mission, the, the kingdom of God, reconciliation, unity. And you need to know God's will for your life. First, you got to be conformed to the image of Christ. That's his purpose in Romans 8, 29, to be conformed to the image of Christ. And then to go make disciples, let people know about this Jesus. Ask him questions. Hey, who, who do you think and who do you say Jesus is? Would you be interested in hearing who I think he is and what I've experienced? And before you do any of that, make sure you pray for the Holy Spirit to soften those folks up. So let me just explain continuous 
repentance, a pathway to spiritual revival, no matter whether it's happening in Toronto or Australia or New York City or anywhere else. We don't have to wait for spiritual revival, you guys. This is an idea that our small group just went through. I'm looking for the book. There it is. Continuous revival. The secret to victorious living. This is a good book for football players, Darren. Look how skinny it is. 80 pages. Woo! We can get this sucker done. The gist of the message is by, by, by Norman Grubb that the Holy Spirit is always available, available to create revival in us and to give us overflowing life. Okay? Abundance, insight, miracles, transformation, victory. But we tend to not allow the Holy Spirit to have full control of us because we miss oftentimes a crucial step in confession and repentance. We only do it vertically. We tell God, some of us wait till Sunday. Some of us do, do it less often than that. But telling God, even if we tell him every day, but we never tell another person horizontally means we're not living in the light. We haven't, we haven't come into the antiseptic of sunshine. We're not living in the freedom of truth and honesty and transparency. And the key to victorious living is confessing and repenting because that empties us so the Holy Spirit can take over. I got to get my, there we go. Of course you should confess vertically, but we need to confess our sins one to another. Maybe not on Twitter or Facebook, although a little humility would be nice. But you need to have that huddle of two best friends that I've talked about every time I've ever been in his deal sessions. Two best friends who you drop your guard with and you ask that question, what's the most important thing going on in your life? Is there anything I can pray about? And then you need to confess your sin, that lust, that pride, that defensiveness with your wife. That's what it is for me. Lust, pride, defensiveness with my wife. Those are my challenges. Uh, maybe a desire for more significance than God wants for me. I got to confess that to other guys and that kills it. God forgives it, but confessing it horizontally kills it. This little book is powerful as heck. The other day, my small group hadn't met and I had wanted to confess to them something about lust and something about um, my prickly defensiveness with my wife. I read this book called Unoffendable. Ever since then, I've been more offendable than ever. My wife says it, it worked the wrong way. Um, mm. I need to change. And I knew I needed to confess to my small group, but the guys were out of town. So we missed our meeting, but I was so excited because I have this new group I formed by Zoom with a couple guys that are speakers. I call it the speaker dudes huddle. And I was thrilled to start the meeting on the Zoom and say, you guys, I got to confess something. And I told them about the lust thing and the, um, the relationship with Stacy, defensiveness, uh, pride thing. And, and then I said, thank you so much for letting me confess to you. And then those guys immediately said, dude, you've been reading my mail. That's what I got going on. And then they confessed. And then they confessed something new. And then all of a sudden they quoted some Bible verses. And then they told some stories. And then we were coaching each other. And we had revival oriented hour and 10 minutes because I chose to get horizontal and confess those sins that I'd already told God about. But I don't think they would have changed very well if I didn't confess them horizontally. Closing thought, if you are a house and you have a roof and you want the Holy Spirit of God, God Almighty, the Father, to come into your life and, and receive from him, guidance from him, healing from him, inspiration from him, revival from him, well, you got to get your roof off. You got to take your roof off and let God in. We're not hiding from God. We're not protecting ourselves. And we have to take the roof off. That's what that vertical confession, immediate, constant, continuous repentance and confession to God. But guess what? You also have these walls up in your house that are keeping you from unity and brotherhood like Reggie White promoted and like we need in our marriages and families and businesses and churches and friendships. You need to take the walls down. 
and start being honest and transparent and vulnerable and confessing your sin to one or two, three close friends or a mentor. And then there's no roof and there's no walls and there's nothing to inhibit God from filling your tank with the Holy Spirit because it's not fully your stupid self and your pride and your planning and your control and your worrying and your finances. Oh, I got to take care of this. My securities and my finances, all my 401k. BS. God owns everything. And the more you hold on to that stuff, the less you're letting the Holy Spirit control you. So take the roof off and confess a lot to God. Take the walls down and confess quickly, swiftly, fully to a close brother or two. Pretty soon you will not be sinning as often in the same ways. It'll become something different, but much less and maybe less frequent. George, you had some thoughts from the Passion Translation of the Bible. Um, I think you mentioned 2 Timothy 2.2. Did you want to mention that? Love to. I want to say in the chat room here, Bink Johnson says to everyone, Ephesians 5, he just wants us to read that. And he says, thank you, Jeff. So encouraging. Let's keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and finish strong. That was from Mark Fournier. And Bink says, how good it is when brothers live in unity, Psalm 133. What a, what a gift this has been today. Uh, I've just taken notes. I've gone through boxes of ballpoint pens here, and it's been wonderful. Uh, when I think of uh, you, Jeff, I think of team leader and of, of uh, teamwork, and how can you be the best teammate? Uh, we have to know what our role is in life. I remember sitting in chapel at Wheaton Academy back in the 50s, speaker after speaker after speaker would come and challenge us to know the will of God for our lives. Uh, nothing has really turned out the way I thought it would uh, 70 years ago, uh, but uh, it's been a wonderful life. And I just have... Go for your life. First to you right now. Can we go to the uh, slide? There you go. It's uh, run as fast as you can from all. Uh, for the rightness and, and be revolutionary and chase after all that is pure. But here's the key. Whatever builds up your faith and deepens your love must become your holy pursuit and live in peace with all those who worship our Lord Jesus with pure hearts. It's, uh, it's almost, uh, uh, Gary Smalley used to teach us about making a, uh, an apology sandwich. And you see at the beginning, it's leave, leave the uh, lust, and at the end, it's cleave, uh, live in peace with those who worship Lord Jesus with pure hearts, like we're doing here today. But here's how you find out what God's will is for your life. You fill in the blank. What builds up your faith and deepens your love must become your holy pursuit. Your holy pursuit is God's will for your life. And it, maybe, it's, maybe it's giving generosity. Alan Pratt teaches us, and Ed McHale teaches us, and Warren Mock teaches us about giving, the importance of giving. Uh, it could be uh, parenting. Jonathan Kasserman uh, teaches us about that. Caregiving, teaching, politics, medicine, evangelism, business coaching. Ask God... And this is one of those analytical times that Jeff spoke about. What is it that builds up your faith and deepens your love? Pursuit. And then as a, as a team leader, your job is to make sure that each member of your team knows his holy pursuit. Because when you have an entire team that all knows their holy pursuit, it's unbeatable. Absolutely no blitz will ever defeat them. George, a comment on holy pursuit. You're leading a non- a, a non-Jesus person, a, a non-believer, and you're wondering, what in the world is their holy pursuit yet? They, they're not, you know, sanctified yet. They're not saved yet. They are made in the image of God with unique giftings and talents, and every one of us has an instinct to want to do something good that leaves a mark. So their, their single greatest strength and the way it contributes to the team and makes the world better is likely the best holy pursuit you can articulate in them. So you could be in a Gideon, uh, a Gideon voice that speaks to them about the unique role when they encourage others or when they clean the floor and make the place work for everyone else. 
find something about them and promote it. And someday they'll wonder what makes you so encouraging, uh, so generous, so apologetic and honest. And they might find that there was a more holy pursuit, which is knowing your creator and Jesus the savior. Keep going, George. Great, thank you. And so this allows when you know, when everybody knows their holy pursuit, each teammate is free to operate in his own strength. And this goes to what Jeff was saying about the six uh, working styles. Uh, I'm going to quote now from, from uh, Graham Cook, who is one of my uh, gurus. And he's just a marvelous author, a, a Britisher. And he, his teaching style is so refreshing. It's like uh, one fortune cookie, Christian fortune cookie after another one. Uh, Graham writes, difficult. to develop in us the things of God. That's seeing the opportunity instead of the problem, which Jeff talks about. The spiritual life is very simple. <laughs> God knows what he intends for us and we decide if we'll cooperate, that's it. We must have a practiced dependence on the Lord. I love that phrase, practice dependence. God allows in his wisdom what he could easily prevent by his power. Isn't that a response that we could, why so much suffering? Why so much bitterness? Why so much uh, sin? God allows in his wisdom what he could easily prevent by his power. He's not out of control. Warriors do not look for rescue. We go into every assignment as victors already. When Jesus is Lord in the ordinary, everyday situations of life, then his overcoming nature rises up in times of extraordinary conflict. We are victorious because of our learned dependency. This is what we've been getting today from Jeff, learning that the Lord is the one whom we serve. We are learning to fight from a place of rest and peace. To not be overwhelmed by fear, anxiety, or panic is a part of our heritage as people of Christ. Can you imagine how your leadership will stand out if in the midst of this current crisis that we're living through, you are a, an example of uh, not being overwhelmed by fear, anxiety, or panic. You're drawn to people like that. Bob Beal says, if you'll if you'll build an island of tranquility, people will swim over alligators to get to it. There will always be tribulation in the world. The Holy Spirit provides a massive ongoing encouragement so profound and amazing that worry, fear, and anxiety simply cannot live in our circumstances. Not wanted. They are banished by the sheer majesty of peace. You have so much peace that worry, fear, and anxiety have, have no home in your life. The Holy Spirit is calm and worried, and, and not worried and not troubled by events. He's, he's peaceful. And the astonishing truth about God is that he can use anything to speak to us and help us. Everything is useful. Romans 8, 28, the storm on the lake, a terrifying demoniac, even death and taxes. Those thoughts are from coming into alignment by Graham Cook. And I encourage you to have a look at that. Uh, Jeff, can we ask the guys about some ahas? Let's do it. We have time. Yeah, I'd like to hear. A step or a change. Maybe there's a confession, something that you realize. I've been telling God I'm sorry about this, but I have not told another man and I'm still not living in the light and I'm not set free. And that kind of explains why I'm not having victorious life. I'm not being revived. Holy Spirit's not dominating me like I want. Um, you don't have to be wonderful. You at least ought to go take it to one or two other friends uh, before the next 24 hours is up. So what are your ahas? What are your nuggets? What do you want to say? I'd like to say something. Um, you know, uh, a big aha was your prayer and starting the day receiving from God. Uh, you know, I, I try to, I try to stay in the word. I try to be the word every day, but when you, it's different. You, you get, you get, uh, you get loose about it. You get uh, disinterested. You lose the fervor. Yeah. I, I confess that I, I do it as almost,
do my reading, I sit there and I'm, my mind is already on what's coming on in the news at six o'clock. And I, uh, I confess that I'm more into what's happening around me than what I'm supposed to be confessing going up. So that really, really got to me. Starting tomorrow morning, my time with the Lord will be different. Mm. I thank you, Jeff. You're welcome, Ray. And I thank the guys who kind of get planted the seed for me. Um, for a couple months, I'd go up to an empty closet in my house. I always thought the prayer closet was a weird idea. <laughs> but I found this empty closet. I have a, a green uh, um, BOSU ball in it. And I'd go in there for four minutes, five minutes. And it was kind of cool because I just felt like, God, it's just you and me. I'm sitting here with you. And I tried to imagine I was sitting in his lap. You know, like, like a grandpa. And I just declared my identity. And I, I came up with this, this prayer that I wrote in my journal. I use it all the time. It's Father God, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit. Fill me. Father me, lead me. Mm. I abide in you. I receive from you. And I transform and change in you. Father God, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, fill me, father me, lead me. I abide in you. I receive from you. And I transform in you. I want to conform to the image of Christ. I can't do it on my own. I stink at that. I can't study the Bible really very well when I'm trying to do it as a Christian. But it's, so, it's totally different when I do it as a son. So I look forward to you going to the Word. Um, this morning, I saw some cool things in the Word because I was excited to say, what's he going to say to me? Jeff, we got some uh, notes here in the chat room. From Stacy Kemp to everyone, what have you not confessed to other guys? Do you want to do it here? It's a find a plan to do it with one to two close friends. <laughs> that was from me. Oh, that was from you. I'm oh. using my wife's. I'm using my wife's com uh, computer. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> uh, Jed says I'm going to go first. Thanks, Jeff. So important to model confession. Rajesh, humbly admitting where and when I am wrong. Bing Johnson, humility, humility, humility. Joel Graves, aha, uh -huh. being on mission with my wife, have a shared vision and then go and execute it. Jeff McDermott, I need to know God as my father. Oh, wow, that's beautiful. Uh, Steve Woodworth, very defensive with my wife and her criticisms. I don't confess that to her enough. I'm going to try to do that every day. Ed McCahill, horizontal confession. I used to do it, but I got busy with life and set that blessing aside. I will restart it tomorrow. Thank you, Jeff. From Kurt, uh, Steve, I echo your sentiment exactly. Gonna soften my defensiveness. He shows me mine. And Ski, the Lord uh, gives us all different strengths that were illustrated effectively in your pictorial. He made us with unique skills and abilities that we need to encourage each other with. Bob Owen, big tip, don't go to bed angry, Ephesians 5, 26. Hey, that's a good one, Bob. Uh, I want to give you a, a couple of a, a verse here that just has been so meaningful to me. And, and I don't know, I really discovered it this past year after reading the Bible all my life. 1 John 4, 17, as he is, so are we in this world. As he is, so are we in this world. We're being conformed into the image of Christ. It's a long way to go for me. But do you realize that the minute we step into eternity, we will be absolutely perfect. We'll be, we'll, we'll be like Christ. We'll be a co-heir. And God is using the experiences of today to whittle us and form us and shape us, mold us into that image of his son. So here's a... Uh, here's, uh, uh, Graham Cook's definition of grace is the only one I've ever heard that, that's put it this way. Grace is the empowering presence of God that enables us to become what God sees us when he looks at us in and through his son, Jesus. Let me read that to you again. Grace is the empowering presence of God that enables us to become how God sees us when he looks at us through his son.
Jesus. What a wonderful process God is putting us through. Let me wrap up with a scripture that came from the Father to me this morning. Um, I was reading about how our righteousness comes to us through Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21. It's, it's imputed. It's given. It's credited to us. It's that grace you were just talking about. He sees us for who we're going to be because he saved us. Um, but, you know, even if that's true, if we don't live this horizontal life of brotherhood and, and confession and live in the huddle and be transparent and vulnerable, uh, we're going to miss out on the real vibrant life God wants. So here's the verses that I came across. Proverbs 18.1 says, if you isolate yourself, it is to pursue selfish desires. And you are rebelling against all sound judgment. If you isolate yourself, it's to pursue selfish desires and you're rebelling against all sound judgment. If you never apologize to your wife, if you never give her your feelings, if you don't let her in on your life, uh, you're isolating. The same applies with never meeting with men and telling the truth. So the principle is this, separating from God and others is selfish and it's self-destructive and it's foolish. It damages yourself, your relationships and your future. Now, Proverbs 18.2, the next verse says, a fool does not delight in understanding, but only wants to air his opinions. Does that sound like the Twitter sphere, the political world? And many times that's what it is in our marriage when we're defensive. We want to air our, our feelings instead of listen and understand and apologize. So here. Thirteen six. It get excited to look at negative stories in the news. It doesn't get excited about gossip. It doesn't get excited about telling how someone who you wanted to beat out just failed. It doesn't recount some dumb thing your wife did or your kid did. It doesn't rejoice in that stuff. It lets go of it. Love rejoices in the truth. Wow. Love rejoices in the truth. Let's rejoice in the truth. Who's the truth? Jesus. What's the truth? The gospel. Where's the truth found? In the word. What's the word point to? Jesus. It's a beautiful, virtuous cycle. Rejoice in the truth every day. Start with the Father. Receive. Confess. Be united. Be a team. Be a reconciler. And let's go be uh, exactly who God wants us to be, his ambassadors. Yep, we're ready to go light our world, Jeff. And we'll listen to um, hey, George song, and uh, then we'll be back to wrap it up. So listen, you can f take this a few seconds here during the song and uh, talk to the Lord about what he's said to you today. We'll be back in just a few minutes here. Frustrated. 
wounded brother See how he's tried to Light his own candle Some other way See now your sister She's been robbed and lied to Still holds a candle Without a flame So carry your candle And run to the darkness Seek out the lonely The tired and warm And hold out your candle For all to see And take your candle Go like the world hearts are blazing so let's raise our candles and light up the sky praying to our father in the name of jesus make us a beacon in darkest times Mike there, my friend. Oh, can we unmute him? Unmute, Joe? yeah, unmute. You? Thank you. Got it? Yes, sir, speak to me. Hey, that was brilliant. Jeff, are you still on there? Yeah, Jack, how you doing? Hey, that was great. It was really brilliant, spirit-inspired, and really, really humble. Jeff, I love to see the way you're grown. It's just you were great in the early days, and the Lord is really working with you. I, it just, it's just great to see you. I'm sitting down here in the desert in, uh, in uh, Toscana. It's a, it's a resort, and I've been here for about a week, and it's really easy to kind of slip away from all the stuff that you said, mm. and I really, I'm sitting here feeling really inspired by your life and by your your humility and the way you're calling us to confess and be transformed. I love it. Hey, thanks, Jack. You know, it's really good to have a, a spiritual father named Jack in my life still. <laughs> That's the highest honor you could give That's me. you, man. You've been, you've, been, you've been there all along. Uh, you've been walking with God a long time, and I appreciate you. Yep. Let, me have, let me have a word with all of you. Who would Who in your circle of friends, your family, would you love to hear what Jeff had to say today? You can encourage them by sending them the link, hisdeal.org, and would be recent meetings. Yeah, go to the meetings page. Go, go to the meetings page, and there will be the uh, tape of today's program. Also, Jeff is available for booking for speeches, 
Uh, he does keynotes. He does uh, retreats. He does one-on-one -on -one counseling with CEOs. And how do they get in touch with you, Jeff? You can take down my email. It's jeff at jeffkempteam.com. And that's the website, jeffkempteam.com. Uh, my phone number is 425-442-1111. Four two five four four two one 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 zero. So, I'm one of the only people in Little Rock, Arkansas, with a four two five area code. I'm not going to lose it. <laughs> well, thanks, Jeff. Um, thanks also to our incredibly gifted and reliable technical director and web designer Joe Hinckley and and Mr. Everything Walter Powers. I'm George Tolls, and um, let's do this again on Wednesday, December second, huh? When we have special guest Denny Fitzpatrick with us. We'll hang around for a bit if you want to visit, but if you're leaving us now, remember, it's all his deal. <laughs>